Welcome fellow bookworms to Briz Den. My name is Whitney and I have a very exciting video for you today. I did finally decide to jump on the bandwagon and I am going to be joining Aurelium Academy. Well, my scholar will be joining Aurelium Academy. Um, and yeah, I was just, I don't know, it seemed overwhelming to me. So like everybody always seems to have so much fun with the Aurelium readathons and such, but it just seemed overwhelming to me. Um, but I finally, I just, <laughs> I was interested in enough after watching so many videos over the last year or so. And so, yeah, I'm going to be joining up. I created my character. I'm not joining for the spring equinox. Um, there's just not enough time. And I do want to read stuff for like the novice path and my character's background and such. So I have all those books. I'm going to be talking about those. Uh, I am going to give myself three months though to read those. So I figure by the time summer starts, I need to have all these read and then I'll be ready to join uh, Aurelium or my character will be ready to join Aurelium come the autumn equinox. Uh, so we're going to talk about my character's background and all that good stuff. And then we'll talk about the books I'm going to be reading over the next few months. A lot of my April TBR did work for the prompts. So a lot of them are on my April TBR. So I will be reading them in April. And then I have one from my May TBR. And then I have four books that are extra, uh, which I'm going to try to read in May, but I'll have um, and through June to read those as well. Um, so if I don't get to them in May, maybe I can add them to my June TBR. We'll just have to kind of play it by ear and see what happens. But let me go ahead and introduce you to my character. I want to give you a little bit of background in case you're not familiar with um, Aldia and like the continents and such. I'm just going to read the ones that... Um, pertain to my character though and if you're interested in learning more I'll leave G from Book Roast all the information linked down below um, their channel and I started with the starter video so I'll definitely link that because that really helped me just kind of break it down and know what I needed and how to set up my character and everything like that it was very very helpful I'm glad she had that video it made it a lot less overwhelming um, and so yeah, so my characters actually, their background is um, both wildling and urban, and they're both from the providence of Etheria and Dark Meadow, <laughs> which will make more sense when I read you their background, but let me go ahead and read you about the continents and such. So Etheria is the greenest continent filled with life. It is home to vast forests and the majority of Aldia's wildlife. There are very few moments of stillness in Etheria as it is con as it constantly buzzes with movement and some say even the mountains cannot stand still. The continent enjoys a perpetual spring season with blooms welcoming the nat natives every sunrise. It is no surprise that earthlings are native to this continent. Their innate affinity to nature magic stems from the ancient powers carried by the roots of the mother tree, which predates the Amalor. Since its arrival, the flora and fauna has flourished even more. Etheria is known for its ruins and tomes or tombs. They are home to many spirits and unknown creatures who guard and protect them from unwelcome eyes. In fact, it's it is considered the most haunt, haunted continent on Aldia. This makes it a popular destination for those seeking knowledge of the past, albeit a very challenging one. Only one urban city can be found on Etheria, beyond which the natural landscape is. People from these lands have usually grown up in small private communities, coexisting with nature outside of technology. The largest population group is Earthlings, followed by Elves. Then Dark Meadow. Harsh cold winds, snowy thunderstorms, and shadow-charged air. These are just a few of the challenges in the lands of Dark Meadow. Due to this hostile environment, a lot of the continent remains unexplored. However, there are tales about hard-shelled demons that roam the lands, devouring anyone foolhardy enough to approach them. The terrain is difficult even for those native to Dark Meadow, which is why the cities of Dark Meadow are underground, sheltered inside the mountain. 
Overnight stays on the surface are not advised. Only the sky morn wisps were ever able to explore the surface fully. Alarmingly, they do not wish to share the findings of these parts with others. It is known, however, that Dark Meadow is home to dragons. Keep that in mind. The underworld, a complex maze of grand underground cities in crystal caves and tunnels, is mostly inhabited by Elterians, who established and maintained the great underworld library. Access to this great trove of knowledge is closely guarded, making it a very coveted privilege for most scholars. Those few fortunate to receive such grace describe the site as breathtaking, marvelous, and glimmering with true light, a rare, pure, silver light magic only found on Dark Meadow. Dwarves are amongst the most frequent visitors. Some have elected to stay forever, charmed by the glorious vastness of the library and the tranquil hospitality of the Elterians. So definitely keep both that, those histories, those continents in mind as we go forward. So my character, Avani, um, which means from the earth, is an earthling and specifically an earth type earthling. So it says earthlings are a race as old and ancient as Aldia with deep connections to the primal elements of nature. They are the only ones who possess magical abilities before the arrival of the Amalor. They present leopard-like spots on their skin which gain a color tint upon their 10th birthday. Green for earth, purple for air, red for fire, and blue for water. Their elemental abilities quickly follow. Earthlings have always had a special relationship with animals and are gifted at handling and sometimes even communicating with them. They have excellent intuition and an eye for detail. A strong connection with the gods of the natural world has helped them fully embrace the power of their elements. Whilst they are most comfortable with their own kind, they are quick to commit to a newfound family. They can be fierce and real, a real force to be reckoned with, but the elements that influence them are not so easily tamed, making them a little unpredictable. Patience is not a virtue that they are known for, but decisiveness and determination are. And so mine is the earth type earthling. So it says green leopard spots. Earth earthlings are the most diverse in appearance. Some might sport antlers, some have hooves, others tree barks, leaves, flowers, or a hard stone shell. To preserve their connection to the ground at all times, they refuse to use any footwear and gloves. Their affinities are elemental magics, animal studies, and alchemy. So there is that. And then we'll um, save this next part for a second so let me talk a little bit more about my character so avani which means from the earth um like i said is an earth type earthling their lunar phase at birth was alignment and their history it says born on etheria in a small community at the age of seven avani accompanied their mother to see the library on dark meadow Unfortunately, Avani's mother did not survive the trip. Avani was by, found by a sky morn and brought to the Ilterians. They were raised to adulthood in the great underworld library where they gained a love for history and knowledge. Avani had no memories of their father or other family, but they always felt a pull to the wilds where they were born. Their appearance, they have a kind of a light stone shell. Um, so it's not very hard. It's, it's a light stone shell. And then their green spots almost appear as lichen on a stone. Um, they have green eyes, which are very sharp and kind of sparkle, almost jewel-like, like an emerald. And their hair is green, brown tinged green. Um, that kind of has a, a mossy texture to it, but it is longer, and so it falls in waves to their shoulders. Their stature, they're kind of short and stout, um, kind of like a squat stone in appearance. So that is their appearance. Um, so their background is both wilding and urban, and they're both from Dark Meadow and Etheria. So they were, until they were seven, they were on Etheria, that's where they were born, um, and then when they went with their mother to Dark Meadow to see the big library, their mother didn't make it. And so they were raised by the Alterians. And so they now have that Dark Meadow, that urban background as well. So they kind of have both worlds, but their roots always go back to um, Alteria, uh, 
er, er, etheria. Sorry, I'm getting Elterians and Etheria. So their background always goes kind of pulled back. Like that's their base nature is living in the wilds, their connection to nature and such. But they did grow up in Dark Meadow in the city. So they have both. Um, and so let's see here. I'll actually just go through all the books after. Um, but we did go down the novice past. We answered all the questions, read the story, answered all the questions. Uh, and we actually had two options for our guild. We could have joined the Arcane Guild, but Avani definitely had their set, a heart set on joining the Archivist Guild. And luckily that was one of the options after we made it through the Novice Path. We were invited to both those guilds, but obviously Avani chose the Archivist. And so the history here, the Archivists are a guild of lore keeping. They are the guardians of knowledge, both lost and forgotten. They deal in ancient magic bestowed upon them by greater powers. As a member, you will be entrusted with tomes upon tomes of stories of old, as well as journeys across Aldia in order to recover pieces of ancient lore yourself. Members study these texts to find hints about creatures, gods, and deities that can be resurrected from history using ancient rituals that they are only that only they are privy to. This is a lengthy and dangerous process and requires a lifetime of dedication, but is highly rewarded. The archivists select a deity they wish to make a pact with, and if successful, they act in their name henceforth. In turn, they are able to channel their magic as their own. They nurture this bond and are able to call upon otherworldly aid in times of need. This can manifest as physical or magical gifts, summon creatures, healing, or miracles. This guild holds a special interest in restoration, which allows them to take on healing rules, as well as mend broken items that could help uncover ancient lore. Members receive unique teachings on conjuration lore and demonology. The ancient art of bookkeeping is one of their specialties. The archivists are more likely to be granted access to the great libraries of Aldia than any other guild and are highly trusted with rare records. In Aurelia, members gain access to the Temple Archive, an impressive sacred library rumored to have underground levels that reach the very crater of the Amaralite Amaral Meteor. Um, so the, they have a unique calling that they can do, which is God Seer. The unique gift is a pact with a god. The unique conduits are po either polearm or a bone. Their guild specialties are conjuration, restoration, demonology, and lore. And guild access, they have access to the temple archive. Um, and so they, Avani is going to use a bone as a conduit um, because it kind of goes along with what they've decided their calling is going to be. And then their pact is going to be with Valinus, which is the god of death and rebirth, uh, amplifies necromancy abilities as well as herbology. Experienced patrons can also communicate with the dead. Temples located in underground caves covered with flowering vines. And obviously, Avani grew up underground and it all kind of made sense to them. Um, and so, yeah, now we have are different callings. <laughs> so, like I said, Avani is uh, quite the overachiever. I didn't mark the callings for some reason. I marked everything else so I could find it easily. Um, but yeah, they they just they want to do a lot. Um, so, with their god pact being with the god um, of death and rebirth birth, they decided that they want to go ahead and have a calling with necromancy, but they also really want to devote their life um, to their god. So they're also going to be doing the calling of god seer. So they're going to be double majoring. So the calling of god seer, which is unique to just the archivist, there's a quote that says, I have walked in the footsteps of divinity. I have peered into what lies beyond. My will is the will of a god. And that's Melia Akara, who graduated in 1876 AA. 
What God seer are capable of depends on the God they follow. They will receive minor boons related to their deity, but their true power comes from attaining a shard of divinity. Only after proving themselves will a God seer be gifted with one. They must devote their life to their God, completing requests from them and influencing events how they see fit. As a result, a God seer often spends their time alone or moving from place to place without making deeper connections. It can be lonely, but you're never truly alone, and they will always find friends in those of their faith. Often, um, the power is received in small flashes, a single vision of the future, a certainty that a thing is true, a blast of radiant power, a wound healing instantly. These small miracles and surprises are largely responsible for the appeal to this lifestyle. You will not have a boring week. Unlike most other magic branches, your powers are not clearly defined. They are known to... There are no known limits to the possibilities. Once they are deemed worthy, the boons they receive are extraordinary. Each shard has a different ability, foresight and vision of the future, omniscience, ability to know everything about the world and its history, omnipresence, to be everywhere and see everything, omnipotence, then the power to change the world to their will. There are even some god seers who are granted immortality, surviving the unsurvivable or living past the years assigned to them. Only the most dedicated gain access to such abilities, and rarely are they blessed with more than one at a time. Key traits are devoid, devoted, loyal, and trustworthy. Um, and again, this is an archivist exclusive. I'm not going to go into the different classes yet. We'll talk about that more at the Autumn Equinox. And then we also have um, Necromancy that we're going to be doing as well. Um, because it goes along very well with kind of what they're planning on doing, um, and with the God of Death and Rebirth, um, and so they wanted to do that as well, um, and it's gonna be a lot of work, that's for sure, so, um, I must have passed it, hold on. Okay, so, found the necromancy. So this is going to be their other calling, um, and so Necromancer, it is a refusal, a refusal to be idle, a refusal to accept what we have been told, a refusal of death. Rin Quili graduated 509 AA. The art of necromancy is one that divides many people. Aurelium it prides itself on being at the forefront of magical research, and as such, it does not restrict what people can learn and teach. This is why many who wish to pursue the art of necromancy find their way to Aurelium. While their dealings with death and afterlife make some uncomfortable, necromancers are capable of offering great comfort. Many work with healers, assisting those in the final stages of their life, and calming loved ones. If foul play is suspected in a person's passing, a necromancer will connect the spirit, contact the spirit of the departed to gain more information about what happened to them. They also work with spell swords to exercise tormented spirits and guide them to rest. And bone conduits are often the work of a necromancer who has crafted or infused the implement, making it suitable for use. However, there are sides of necromancer's power that unsettles people. They can wield the power of death itself and attack with a violent necrotic energy. If wounded, they can sap the life force from someone else to heal themselves. During battle, they can raise armies of the dead to fight for them. The people they resurrect lack the spirit or soul and merely become an empty, mindless vessel for destruction. Some find it intolerable for their loved ones to be used in such a way. Even a necromancer's presence can cause whispers and fearful glances because of the familiars they keep, animated skeletons of birds, dogs, and cats, and on rare occasions, people. For a necromancer, death is but a suggestion rather than a definitive, definitive end. Um, key traits are defiant, decisive, and willful. And then, because that's not enough, um, they are kind of going back to their roots a little bit. And they are also going to be minoring in herbology. Luckily, the coursework for herbology is pretty light. Um, and so that shouldn't be as bad as double majoring in both, um, whatchamacallit, necromancy and as a god seer. So, said very, very and. Ambitious. 
Um, but herbology, so root of fire leaf, essence of wolf love, dry ghost petal, once distilled, a single drop is enough to see into the spirit realm. Excerpt from Magic of the Wild by Melina Root. Herbologists work with various professions, including healers, spell swords, and alchemists. They provide the natural ingredients for rituals and potions. Trust and proven, trusted and proven herbologists are given permission to work in the aurelium gardens and groves, often working the land and in the green or in greenhouses by themselves. It can be peaceful, solitary career. Exceptional. Exceptional herbologists communicate with plants. Reports show that the communication is instinctual and emotional rather than verbal. Um, said connection grants them a deep awareness of their surroundings. It is rare to sneak up on a herbologist as plants and flowers warn them long before a person's arrival. The longer a herbologist practice, the more in sync with the seasons their powers become. The strengths and weaknesses of their powers shifting to match the weather. The pay in this field of work can be low. Some magical plants are volatile and, if not cared for properly, have the potential to destroy entire crops and waste a year's work. Fortunately, many ingredients for powerful potions and rituals are extremely rare and successful harvests of such a crop can prove very profitable. Though most herbologists choose this career for passion rather than profit, they spend their entire day tending to plants, caring for them, harvesting them, and planting future crops. If you're lucky, you get a chance to work in a huge glass dome constructed by artificers to replicate the conditions of different biomes, allowing for varied plant growth in one location. While the job can be physically demanding, it is rarely under intense time pressure. There are very few careers with the slow pace of a herbologist that also feels so fulfilling and useful. Um, and key traits are nurturing, gentle, caring, care, caring, careful, and patient, which, you know, isn't really... doesn't really go with my uh, Avani's personality. Um, but it does go with the god of Valinus, which... And flies necromancy's necromancy abilities as well as herbology. So kind of come back around to that. But that's still not enough because <laughs> they also grew up where there were dragons. And it has always been a dream of theirs to um, become a dragon rider. So that's exactly what they're going to do. So they are going to have... A supplemental in dragon riding uh, to get their dragon riding li license and so it says dragon riding school is once again open have you always dreamt of soaring the skies on the back of a, dra a mighty dragon now you can sign up today you might be the next dragon rider on call training consists of five months a five-month theory assessment covering dragon etiquette and two-month practical flying course during this time, you'll learn about the traditions and appearance of different dragon races, as well as work alongside dragon tamers and learning the best techniques for communicating with, saddling, and mounting the beast. If successful, you will be awarded a five-year standard dra dragon riding license, recognized and valid all over Aldia. You will need to sign a legal death and serious injury waiver upon sign-up. You're allowed two failed attempts. If failed further, you must wait two years until you your next try. Requirements are to read two books with dragons, watch a movie slash show with a dragon. Um, so yeah, they uh, are going to be having quite the undertaking for sure um, come the autumn equinox, but it's definitely, I think, going to be worth it. They all go together very, very well, um, and I think it's going to work out very nicely for Avani if they can be successful. But the higher-ups at Aurelium did have their doubts as well. And so in order for them to be set up to start the Autumn Equinox and be able to do both callings with their minor and dragon riding, they are requiring them to complete some reading in the meantime. Um, and so they need to read a book for each stop on the novice path. And then they also need to read a book for the different backgrounds. Um, and so for the novice path, you need to read a book with a map. 
I'm going to be reading the third book in the uh, Shadow and Bone trilogy, and that is Ruin and Rising by Lee Bardugo. Um, I didn't actually check. I know the other ones have had maps, um, and so I'm sure this one has one too, and it does. So it does have a map, and I'm excited to finally finish out this trilogy and hopefully move on into the rest of the Grishaverse books. Um, but yeah, this is the third book. And so basically you have, um, what is her name? Alina. Uh, and she kind of grew up uh, not realizing she had the abilities of a Grisha, which are magical abilities. And when they have to cross the fold, which is like the scar across the land where there's a bunch of like dark demons and such, um, their convoy gets attacked and her abilities come out. Um, and so she gets pulled in to work with the Grisha and the, um, what is it? The Darkling, I want to say is what he's called. Um, but there's kind of ulterior motives, and so then the series just kind of goes from there. There's three different animals that each book kind of features on, which have a gone do it, which help amplify their magic powers, which also goes very well with Aurelium. So that's going to be the first book. Um, well, not the first book that I read, but, you know, the first book on the list to read. Uh, so we have that. Then, of course, we had a stop at the Ashtorn Tree, um, and this is a book that keeps tempting you or that's on top of your TBR. Uh, and so for this one, I'm going to go with Butcher and Blackbird. I forget who the author is, but again, the picture will be up here and it'll be listed down below. Um, and yeah, I'm going to be listening to this one. Uh, from the moment people started talking about this, I was very, very intrigued by it. I did get it on Audible, but I haven't had a chance to listen to it yet, but I keep, I want to. I, like, really, really want to. It's not officially on a TBR, so that's going to be one that I do need to work in at some point, um, but I'm very, very excited to listen to that one particularly. I'm a more of a physical reader, but this one, they have a narrator for e um, each of the main characters. Uh, and instead of like, you know, how a lot of books that have multiple narrators, it'll be like one chapter is told from this person's point of view, and then the next chapter switches over. This one, they're actually talking back and forth and playing off of each other. So I'm very intrigued and very excited about that. Then we have The Mist of Solitude, and it is to read a standalone. So this one is, um, it is on my April TBR, and so I will be reading it this month, and that is The Moth Keeper by K. O'Neill. This is actually a graphic novel, and I'm very, very excited about this. I forgot to tell you what Butcher and Blackbird is about. So basically, it's about two serial killers who fall in love. Like, that's all I know. That's all I need to know. And I'm very intrigued by it. Um, and then this one is about uh, Anya. And she's finally taking her place as protector of the moon moss. The luminous creatures enabled that enable the night flower to bloom and the night village needs the night flower to thrive. Being a moth keeper is a great responsibility. Night after night, it is lonely in the desert with only one lantern for light. So Anya is eager to prove her worth, to show her thanks to her friends and her village. But is it worth the cost? And yet something isn't right. What happens when Anya glimpses the one thing that could destroy what she's meant to protect? The one thing that she has secretly longed for for her whole life. And I think this goes really, really well with like the herbologist aspect, the earthly aspect. Um, and I'm excited to read this one. Like I said, it is on my April TBR, so I will be able to get to it right away. Then we have The Ruin of the Sky. And this is to read a book featuring ghosts, slash um, a haunted house or other supernatural elements. And I am going to be reading The um, the Diviners by Libra Brit Bray. This is one I've been interested in for a while, and I'm really excited to finally be able to get to it. Again, it's not officially on a TBR, 
so it is going to be added in and it is pretty chunky um but the font is actually pretty big so i think it's gonna be a fairly easy read um even though it's chunky and so basically in this one i forget the main character's name um but she goes with her uncle and he's like does occult things and like seances and such um but the main character actually has access to the occult uh, and then there's some kind of crime and she realizes that she could potentially help solve it. Um, and yeah, I'm really, really excited to get to this one. But like I said, it is extra. Um, so we'll have to work it in. Then we hit the Obsidian Falls. And this is to read a thriller or mystery book. I don't have the book yet. It is on its way. And that is going to be Sadie by Courtney Summers. I don't remember exactly what this one is about. I just know I've heard fantastic things about it, um, and I cannot wait to read it, so um, I don't have it in front of me. I film on my phone, and so I'm not entirely certain what it's about, but I know it's kind of a, a thrillery, um, I think young adult type book, and so I'm so excited because I've heard fantastic things and it's been on my wish list for a while and it is on its way. So there's that one. Then we hit the Tower of Rumination and this is to read a five star prediction. So I'm going to be listening to another audiobook for this and that is Emily Wilde's Map of the Otherlands by Heather Fawcett. And I listened to the first book and absolutely loved it. I love the narrator. Um, just the pacing of the story, the way it was told was fantastic. And so I have the audio book for the second one in that series. And so basically Emily Wilde is a scholar. And in the first one, she ends up going to research these fairies because she's creating an encyclopedia of fairies. And there's this one type of fairy that not a lot is known about. So she goes to kind of this remote location um, and to study these fairies and things ensue is very funny like very humorous um and so she also has um like an academic rival that comes and there's a little bit of romance there uh, and I'm just really really excited to continue the series and listen to it again because I really enjoyed listening to that first one and we have the Aurelium Academy Arc and this is to read a book with a school setting. So this is the only one that's actually on my May TBR. And I'm going to be reading Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix. Because obviously Harry Potter, the whole series, basically takes place at Hogwarts, which is a school setting. Um, and yeah, I'm excited to continue on with my reread of this one. Another one that's my childhood copy and a little bit worse for wear, but not as bad as some of the other ones. Um, cause obviously later in the series, I would always read, reread each time a new one came out. <laughs> so the other ones got reread a lot. This one, not as much. Uh, but yeah, I'll be continuing on with the Harry Potter series. Then we have our backgrounds. Um, so because they are wildling the first half of their life and then they grew up urban, I'm going to be fulfilling the prompts for both. The requirement was just for one per the, the school higher ups. Um, but to wildling is to read a book largely set in a forest or outside. I am going to be reading, um... Wizard's First Rule by Terry Goodkind. My husband picked me this. This is on my April TBR. It's a high priority one um, because it's for my game. It's for Tales from Two Trails, which is put on by Kim at Expedition Through Pages. And now it's for my wildling background. And I asked my husband because he's the one that said I need to read this. He chose it for me. Uh, and he said it does. It starts off kind of in forest, and then the majority of the book takes place outside. So that will work for that one. Then for Urban, it is to read a book set in a city or town. And this is another extra one that I will be reading. Um, and I'm going to be reading The Secret Life of Bees. I'm not entirely sure what this one's about, so I kind of skipped up. 
Um, it says, the twilight has fallen upon the three kingdoms, a gray time that could foretell either dawn or descent into a bitter night. Richard Cipher, woodsman and warrior, is chosen to bear the powerful sword of truth, but his enemy, dark and raw, is a royal mage who commands armies, hideous beasts, and more terrible by far a twisted magic. Terry Goodkind tells a compelling story of a magical world that mirrors our own, a world in which goodness and honesty are besieged by the forces of darkness and deceit. Richard Cipher's Odyssey is a journey of the utmost risk and uncertain reward for the sake of love. It's a journey into darkness of the human soul, an extraordinary adventure has begun. Join us in discovering where it will lead. Well, that's what that one's about. But The Secret Life of Bees is for my urban setting. Um, and this is by Sue Monk Kid. I did see the movie ages and ages and ages ago. Um, but I'm excited to read the book and it's nice and short. So this is an extra one I'll be working in. But it says, set in South Carolina in 1964, The Secret Life of Bees tells the story of Lily Owens, whose life has been shaped around the blurred memory of the afternoon her mother was killed. When Lily's fierce-hearted black stand-in mother... Rosaline <coughs> assaults three of the deepest racists in town. Lily decides to spring them both free. They escape to Tiburon, South Carolina, a town that holds the secret to her mother's past. Taken in by an eccentric trio of black beekeeping sisters, Lily is introduced to their memorizing worlds of bees and honey and the Black Madonna. This is a remarkable novel, novel about divine female power, a story that women will share and pass on to their daughters for years to come. So again, you have that bee, that nature aspect that goes along well with an earth earthling. Um, and then also there's that mother aspect, kind of the mystery of their mother and the death, which works really well for Ivani, whose own mother, you know, tragically died on the journey to Ulterian, so, or Dark Meadow, to the Ulterians. So there's that one. Um, again, extra that I'll have to work in. And then we have th where they kind of grew up, their providence. So we have both Dark Meadow and Etheria. Um, and so for Dark Meadow is to read a Dark Academia book. Um, and I only had one on my shelf that I haven't read yet. Uh, so I thought about maybe getting the auto audio book for some different ones. Um, I was looking at Goth, Gothicania. Um, forget the author again. I'll insert it here and mention it down below. Uh, I did not like the narrator for that one though. And so I decided to go with the book that I already had on my shelves. And I'll be reading A Deadly Education by Naomi Novak. Or Novik. Um, and yeah, this will be my second book by this author. I've read Spinning Silver by them. But it says, enter a school of magic unlike any you have ever encountered. There are no teachers, no holidays, friendships are purely strategic, and the odds of survival are never equal. Once you're inside, there are only two ways out. You graduate or you die. Elle Higgins is uniquely prepared for the school's many dangers, but she may be without allies. She possesses a dark power strong enough to level mountains and wipe out untold millions. Never mind, easily destroy the countless monsters that prowl the school. Except she might accidentally kill all the other students, too. So Elle is trying her hardest not to use it. That is, unless she has no other choice. Um, and I've heard mixed things about this one, but I found it at a thrift store. And it works for this prompt, so I'll finally get a chance to read it. Again, an extra one that I'll have to work in. And then for Etheria, it's to read a book that features a fae or elven characters. Um, I am going to be reading, this one works so perfect for this, The Return of the King by J.R.R.L. Tolkien. This is the last book in the Lord of the Rings trilogy. Um, I've already read The Hobbit as well. Uh, and this is also on my April TBR. I've been trying to get to it for months and months, and it just happens to work. That's on my April TBR, and it works for this. And so I'm going to be reading this. And of course, you have all kinds of creatures. Um, basically, it follows Frodo and the Fellowship of the Ring, which is con consists of other hobbits, dwarf, an elf, um, Gandalf the Wizard, humans. You know, it's just a whole mixed bag of characters. Um, and they're trying to take the Ring of Power to Mordor to destroy it. Um, and of course, there's other things going on throughout the book. So I'm 
finally going to be getting to this one. Um, and I'm actually going to be reading it this week that I'm filming this. So um, I'm excited to finally, finally get that read. Then let's see here. Then we have Earthling. And so this is to read a book with elemental magic or an element word in the book or series title. So either air, earth, fire, and water. And so another one on my April TBR is Little Fires Everywhere by Celeste Ng. Um, and yeah, finally going to be getting to this one as well. I haven't had this one that long. I found it at a thrift store, but it is one I've been interested in. Uh, and so I'm going to finally be reading it. it. says, In Shaker Heights, a placid progressive suburb of Cleveland, everything is planned from the layout of winding roads to the colors of the houses to the successful lives its residents will go on to lead. And no one embodies the spirit more than Elena Richardson, whose guiding principle is playing by the rules. Enter Mia Warren, an enigmatic artist and single mother who arrives in this idyllic bubble with her teenage daughter, Pearl, and a disregard for the status quo that threatens to un upend this carefully ordered community. Suspicious of Mia and her motives, Elena is determined to uncover the secrets of Mia's past, but her obsession will become will come at an unexpected and devastating cost. Little Fire Everywhere explores the weight of secrets, the nature of art and identity, and the ferocious pull of motherhood, and the danger of believing that following the rules can avert disaster. Um, so yeah gonna be my pick for that and then let's see here then we have our conduit which is bone and so this is we need to read a book with a bone or skull on the cover or the word bone in the title slash series name um and skulls are considered bone too so skulls can be in the title or series name i'm actually going to read another book that's not here yet but it's on its way and that's 39 clues which is number one in that series and then the first book is called Maze of Bones, and it's by Rick Riordan. Um, and so it's on its way. It has skulls on the cover. It has bone in the title. Uh, and so when it gets here, and luckily it's a short children's book, so that will help me get it read. So I'll be reading that once it gets here. And then lastly, we have our legacy from our guild, which is the god of Alinus, which again is the god of death and rebirth. And so this is to read a book with high stakes, where you think the characters could die. And for this one, I'm going to be reading another one from my April TBR, and that's This Dark Descent by Kaylin Josephson. This was a gift, again, from Mariana. I know I mentioned it every time, but every time I talk about this book, I want to just make sure I mention that. Um, and yeah, this is a book I'm very, very excited for. I thought about putting this in, like, the five-star prediction or a book that keeps tempting me, um, but it works for this one, and I'll tell you why. <laughs> so it says, The Russell family is famous throughout Enderlane as breeders of enchanted horses, but their prestige is no match for their rising debts. To save her family's ranch, Makira Russell is left with only one option. Enter the Illinear, a treacherous cross-country horse race known as much for its high body count as its enticing prize money so the stakes are very very high um and yeah if you have any chance of success makira will have to recruit ariel kadar a talented but unlicensed enchanter who creates golems in place of enchanted animals and damien adair a dashing young lord in the midst of a fierce succession battle both have mysterious reasons of their own to help makira as well as their own blood feuds to avenge steeped in jewish folklore the stark descent is a spellbinding new fantasy full of intrigue romance and pulse pounding action in a world as dangerous as this will hidden agendas and conflicting desires brocher makira ari and damon's chance of winning the illinaire or will another writer's dagger so it definitely has high stakes it also has a map so it could have worked um for that prompt as well like it fulfills many many prompts um but yeah i'm so excited look it has family trees it's got all kinds of information in here um and yeah i'll be reading this one i think this week maybe next week is my plan to get to this one because i just don't want to wait for it anymore uh and yeah so those are the books i'll be reading like i said i have until um summer starts so through the beginning of june 
um, to read these books <laughs> and we will see how it goes and then once I get those read I'll be all set up for the autumn equinox and of course we'll go over the requirements for the different classes um, and such once that arrives and we'll have a lot of reading to do so my plan is in August I probably won't play my TBR game um, I'll probably just focus and depending on how it works out I might also give myself two months I think that's pretty fair um, especially generally in school you don't just have a month to complete your classes so we'll just have to kind of see how that plays out I am because some of the classes overlap for the different callings uh, I am requiring myself though to fulfill the prompts for each um, class and not double up or each calling uh, so yeah we'll just have to have to see how that how that goes but I'm really excited like I said I every time Aurelium comes around I get really excited um, I'm gonna go ahead and wrap up because they're barking and yeah let me know if you've read any of these if you're interested in any of these any information about your character or your calling I would love to know or if you're in the same guild as Ivani I would love to know that as well if you don't know what to say or you just want to let me know you're here you can always leave a rabbit or any animal emoji down in the comments below i'm gonna leave you here happy reading everyone bye